Hello, uh, this is chapter 18. Um, this is a continuation of chapter 17. And I think I forgot to make the videos for this. When I was looking through the list, I figured out that I didn't make it. This chapter has to do a lot with water pollution. What are the sources of water pollution? How does water pollution take place? So in chapter 17, we did all the different types of water sources that we have. Um, whether it's groundwater, aqu aquifers, river water, lake water, fresh water, ocean water, all of that stuff. This chapter is essentially how we go ahead and pollute all of those things. Um, I covered a lot of it in chapter uh, 17. Um, so I, when I test you guys on chapter 18, I would suggest that you actually go through chapter 17, watch the videos for chapter 17, and then watch the videos for chapter 18, because I'm going to re refer to a lot of things like I'm going to skip through a lot of things and say and ask and refer to the older videos. Oh, that looks bad. So a couple of things are going to be very, very important here, um, especially for your multiple choice. Um, that is, I really enjoy writing with this thing. So much fun. That is point and non-source uh, points. Um, you will have to identify them. So on a multiple choice question, they can give you four different sources and ask you to pinpoint which one is a point source and which one is a non-point source. That means you will have that on your test in class also. So, um, water pollution can be anything. It can be f physical. You can dump plastic in it. Uh, that would be physical if you dumped a bunch of plastic. Um, plastic would be physical. Um, biological would be various. Um, bacteria would be, I'm just going to use BAC as uh, for bacteria, bacterial, viral, um, any kind of um, non-native species. Um, it could also be uh, something in terms of uh, uh, plant life. Anything that's non-native, anything that's living comes under bacteria. Chemical can be, um, especially we've talked about this in the past, um, NOCs, uh, nitrates, um, sulfates, um, SOCs and NOCs, which are byproducts of the mining industry, most of your household chemicals. I think in the past we talked about um, the fact that there's so much biological viral particles in the water, um, herpes virus in the water that sea lions are getting herpes and that's biological. Um, and there's also the fact that there is a ton of estrogen in the water um, causing birth defects and um, you know, irregular birth patterns within fish and estrogen there would be chemical. Any of these things can be considered to be water pollution. Uh, there are two different types of water pollution, point source and non-point source. Point source just is that, where you can pinpoint the source. Uh, if you have a particular um, industrial industry that's discharging some kind of pollutant into the water, it becomes a point source. If there's a particular drain pipe, um, for example, into the ocean, you know, it collects all the sewage, sewage and it drains into the ocean. Yay for slipping, swimming in the ocean. Um, that is a point source. Uh, the um, Hudson River, the Hudson River was polluted by a lot of point sources. Uh, there was a ton of tanneries around that area. There was a ton of uh, different types of factories around that area that basically polluted this water. Point source is actually easier to deal with because if you if you know which factory is actually polluting uh, the river, which factory is dumping all the cyanide into the water or dumping all the bleach into the water, you can take immediate action. Um, and non-point source is more scattered and diffused. For example, stuff that you flush down your toilet is a non-point so so source. However, the stuff that you flush down your toilet right now, except for chemicals, 
like estrogen, testosterone, um, your oxycodone and all of that stuff. Everything else is actually uh, cleaned up and purified. Um, if you have agricultural farms, as well as multiple agricultural farms, and you cannot, if there's multiple agricultural farms, you cannot pinpoint which one is using a lot more nitrate um, nitrates in their soil, which one's using a ton more NKP fertilizer, which one's having is not effective. These things are more difficult. You have to like slap a uh, restraint a basic water restraining order against all of them it becomes a little more complicated feedlots are just um, cattle ranchers um, corporate farming of poultry and cows and all of that stuff those are feedlots golf courses they drain into one source so they basically drain into one basic source and then from there they're collected and then they drain into the you know they have a runoff uh, residential construction sites, residences, all of these things come under non-point source. So when we've talked about uh, non-point sources, there's always atmospheric or deposition. For example, um, if you think about a farm that is the, that they are spraying pesticides on um, or they are spraying some kind of uh, fertilizer onto it a nicotine in a, a nicotine based fertilizer or um, a pesticide with some kind of a um, let's say a round um, round up uh, round up based fertilizer if they're spraying it from the air when you have those little um, single engine uh, aircrafts that spray this stuff uh, that is not there's no guarantee that it is actually going to all of it is going to deposit on your farm and just just on your farm the, they're carried by air currents and they pollute clo uh, nearby um, sources of water um, they become a part they, they deposit on different areas where there's no there's no farm um they drawn when it rains there's a runoff when there's snow there's runoff and there's when it becomes dry enough the wind carries it uh this is very interesting uh 600 000 kilograms of herbicide uh, was sprayed was found in the great lakes and the great lakes are surrounded by it's in the area where there's a lot of corn farming and there's a lot of soybean farming and that's herbicide that was used on different farms this is why non-point source becomes such a big problem because you do not have one culprit there is not one person that you can go there's not one company that you can go and say hey you did this it is your responsibility to clean it up you really can't do that so these are just a couple of different things, a uh, couple of different uh, types of contaminations. We've talked about animal waste. Uh, we've talked about coliforms. Um, the word is, I think it comes up in the next few slides. Um, just human waste, animal waste that leaches into the water, human waste, animal waste, any kind of excrement waste has a ton of bacteria in it. They're not meant to be in your water source. Oh, there you go coliform bacteria uh when you are a nation that has a little more money like the united states and i think i talked about this in the previous in chapter uh 17 uh when you are a wealthier nation you the cost of water is much cheaper because you are actually able to uh, clean up more water and you're using and you have sewage treatment plants and you're reusing the water whereas if you have if you are in an underdeveloped or developing country, there's not a proper sewage treatment system. So water is actually more expensive um, because we tend to recycle water. We have something, I think in chapter 17, we talked about reclamation water, um, which way we can take out the coliforms. We can take out a couple of, you know, up to, to safe levels. We can take out a lot of contaminants and then use it in somewhere else. Reclamation water is used a lot to water parks, to water your golf courses. It's not drinking water. It's not water that's used in your house, but it is water that's being recycled. Um, 
you can disinfect water using chlorination techniques, using ultraviolet, um, using um, actually so now they even use sonar. There's different things that you can do to, cl um, uh, to clean out the water. But each and everything that we're talking about right now costs money. And in a developing nation, that's going to be an issue. Polluted water, no swimming or raining. Why would you do that anyway? That water looks dirty. Again, uh, we have talked about oxygen demand a waste. Uh, think um, just it would help you guys to think about uh, BODs, biological demand on oxygen. The more life form you have in there, uh, the more demand there is for oxygen. The more demand there is for oxygen, the more oxygen is removed from the water. Um, and, you know, we've talked about algae covering the top part of it and actually suffocating life underneath. So all of these things, none of these things are actually new. Just go to chapter 17 and we have covered this in chapter 17. Um, biochemical demand for oxygen or biological demand for oxygen. Dissolved oxygen content is the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in water. That is the amount of oxygen uh, that is available for life forms that live within the water. The more life forms you have, the more contaminants you have. There are two different types. If you remember oligotrophic and eutrophic, the more eutrophic the, uh, the water is, there's more life forms living that, not desirable life forms, not even life forms that are native. You might be very species uh, abundant, but not diverse. Um, and then one organism will just basically take over and cut off the oxygen supply for other organisms, which will basically uh, is very harmful for the health of that water body. This is a very important picture and I am going to explain this more in detail in class. So, so. Yeah, but it is also pretty self-explanatory. Uh, again, class, we have talked about oligotrophic. Um, the oligotrophic usually is a huge one of the reasons why you have oligotrophic. Mining is a big cause of this, where really harsh chemicals are let into the water. It basically kills everything. It's sparkling, clear water. You can see the bottom of the lake. Uh, that's because nothing is living in it. That water is pretty much acidic or alkaline. Uh, eutrophic is when you have runoffs, agricultural runoffs. There's, there's an increase in the level of um, nutrients available in the water because there's a lot more nitrogen in the water. There's a lot more oxygen in the water. There's a lot more sulfur in the water. So the water has a lot more nutrients. So then you have a ton of organisms that grow in there and live in there, which basically the lake or the river or whatever water body you're talking about cannot sustain it. Um, algae blooms, that is where the top of the uh, lake is completely covered with uh, different types of algae, cutting off circulation to the bottom. Um, kills everything else, but one type of organism that thrives very well in this tends to... Um, take over. It does the exact same thing that anything that an invasive species does. Agriculture is a part of this. Cultural eutrophication, uh, cultural eutrophication has more to do with entirely nothing but human activity. Uh, you have cultural eutrophication that happens in uh, in suburban areas, in the middle of the cities. We have our own runoff. Think about all the chemicals you spray on your in your lawns. That itself is um, causes so much runoff because all you do there is you know let let spray your uh, lawn with pesticides and herbicides and all of that stuff and then water your lawn there if whatever is used is used the rest of it there is a runoff you when you're spraying your lawn do not measure how much you're spraying you do not 99.99 percent of the people don't even follow the instructions they don't measure their lawn by square foot and then you know measure how much of pesticides they're spraying on it and 99.99 percent of us don't do it by ourselves. We have Jesus do it. 
Um, again, we've talked about red on uh, the red tide. Uh, this is the dinoflagellates. For people who have already done AB biology, you should know that the dinoflagellates um, are of, from the family of protists. It's very toxic.